Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very special morning episode of the show because we have music royalty in the house, ladies and gentlemen. This gentleman goes way back over 30 years being in the industry. You can see him on Compton's Most Wanted, as well as on one of my favorite video games. Uh, he's the voice, actually. I'm so excited of Lance, um, Lance Wilson on the uh, San Andreas 2004. That was one of the biggest games um, in video game history. And then also he was on Minister Society and so much more. It's such an honor to have him on the show. Uh, the legendary MC8. But before we get to him, ladies and gentlemen, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by Pure Essence Television, where you can see some of the greatest interviews of your life, from the Isley Brothers to Stevie Wonder to Joe Montiga, as well as this interview right there on Pure Essence Television. Just look at the link on your monitor. Download the greatest interviews of your life. And if you ever want to see the Sherrard Show 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just download it to Airy TV and you can see me with the Jerry Curl. You can see me with the butter. You can see me with all these different hairstyles because we go way back to the history of the Sherrard Show. That's right on the Airy TV. And then also, if you missed this broadcast on television, you can also listen to it on iHeartRadio. Just click the link and you can smile and drive. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this gentleman goes back to the box where you can be able to uh, dial up what you wanted to hear and watch on television. He goes back to Yo MTV Raps and so much more. He is an actor. He is an entrepreneur. And he's been doing big things for many, many years. And I'm so honored to have the legendary MC8 on the Sherrard Show for the first time. Welcome, sir. It's an honor. How are you? What's good with you, fam? Thanks for having me. You know, um, eight, we can jump right into it. Um, you know, you've been representing for many years and you've uh, changed the culture in so many years. But let's talk about music. Now, what was the thing that got you into being a rap artist growing up in Compton? Well, you know, um, growing up, you know, you could say, um, I guess my dreams or uh, my, my uh, dreams or visions of being a, uh, uh, you know, I had that typical uh, kid dreams. I want to be a policeman, a fireman, that shit, you know. Um, uh, but uh, coming of age, uh, growing up in Compton, uh, you know, you saw a lot of gang influence. Um, so basically, I turned, uh, that was my vision, being a gangbanger, you know. Uh, but... Um, Got introduced to rap on a on a summer vacation to uh, Mississippi, where my uh where my mom was from. Uh, one of my cousins introduced me to uh, Run DMC and Midnight Star and all of that type of stuff. So uh, coming back home and you know growing up and being introduced to hip hop, you know uh, a lot of East Coast influence, you know. Uh, Run DMC, I listen to Treacherous 3 and a lot of early uh, uh, MC Shan and KRS. But then, you know, uh, the, the, the development on the West Coast, you know, we had uh, music like uh, World Class Wrecking Crew and we had uh, uh, Unknown DJ and stuff like that. So um, being introduced to... Um, Toddy T, who was from my neighborhood, he had a song called The Batarang. And um, by basically hearing that type of music, it influenced me to want to start um, writing uh, lyrics about where I was from and basically what I was going through. So it's probably around the time of 88, 89, you know, early, early Easy E, early King T, early Ice T, you know. Uh, dog in the wax, you don't quit. Uh, King T with uh, Payback's a mother and the coolest, you know, songs like that. Uh, so basically, that's what got me into wanting to rap. So we formed the group Compton's Most Wanted, me and Chio, uh, DJ Ant C, and then we started uh, making records. I think our first single was a song called Rhymes Too Funky off the Compton compilation. Now, people don't understand, uh, the people who are, you know, 20 and younger or not even 30 don't understand how lit 
Compton was, especially in the late 80s, early 90s. Now, one thing that's interesting about it is that um, when I was watching you on Yo! MTV Raps and The Box and all that, you know, you were singing about, like you just mentioned, what you were growing up doing and what you've been through. But those are real stories. It's not like you were you weren't a studio gangster. That was things you were really going through. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, we didn't, you know, at, at that time, we didn't know what a, quote, studio gangster was, you know. Uh, stuff I talked about uh, and rapped about is basically because it was stuff we was doing in the neighborhood every day. Uh, it was stuff I was witnessing basically growing up in Compton. Uh, uh, you know, I hung out on the block every day, you know, the, the, the high schools, you know, Compton was gang infested, uh, uh, police, uh, you know, brutality, racial profile and all of that. So the stories I talked about were things I saw growing up and participating in, you know, being a young adolescent growing up in Compton. I mean, like I said, there wasn't too many other influences, but the gang lifestyle. So um, it wasn't one of those, those, those scenarios where, you know, uh, I'm, I'm seeing, or I'm taking stories from other people and, and creating my own, uh, uh, uh fantasy uh so to speak uh i was basically i grew up in compton i grew up in a place called spook town um i was gang banging from a place called trag new park so um i walked those streets every day so being shot at being took to jail having to you know go through those those uh those tribulations of, of being a, a, a 13 year old kid in Compton at the time of, of eight, 1985, where, you know, if you saw the movie Colors, that was a, a, you know, a great depiction of what was happening in the streets of Compton, Watts, LA, Long Beach. So at that time, if you, if you was a young black kid and you didn't have no, you know, if you didn't have no other uh, other visions of trying to escape, you basically you, you were round up in the gang lifestyle. So the tales I spoke about when I was writing lyrics, you know, that, that was some shit we went through last night or we was on the corner and the police came through and they jacked us and we all went to the holding tank or, you know, the, the dark car came with the headlights off and they start shooting and one of the homies got shot. You know, those were things that really happened. You know, um, I didn't know what one time was until I learned it from you. Right. I mean, um, did you did you start that that uh, calling them one time? No, that was a uh, like that was a term uh, that we as neighborhood, you know, compadres. That was just a term that we had given to the police. You know, we called them one time, you know, because that was it, you know. So that was something we all, every neighborhood, everybody, you know, if if you were South, if you were Southern California and you was in, in a neighborhood, the police was the one times. You know, when we were growing up in Chicago, we called the detectives the jump out boys. Because yeah. you know when they pulled up on you, they would just jump out on you. So that was yeah, something exactly. that we would talk Definitely. about it in Chicago. Something. But you, but you know, one of my favorite um, um, music videos from you was the hood and gaffled me up. You know, I love that took one. Me under. Hood took me under. Hood took me under. Um, because that was so graphic that you know when I was a kid, that came out in '92. Is that about correct? Right. So when I was watching that. Um, it depicted Compton, um, South Central and all that and what was going on. And at the time I was only 18. So I was thinking, is that true? And you're now telling me that's absolutely what was going on back then. Is that correct? Oh, definitely. Um, I wrote The Hood Took Me Under because, um, like I said, um, it was like a five or six year old kid, you know, woke up on Saturdays, watched those cartoons and ate cereal with my sister in the living room. And, Thank you know, you. the 70s was a good time to be a kid, you know, for me. Um, but like I said, uh, growing up in Compton with a single mom, uh, you living on a block 
where, you know, at one end of the street, you know, there's a Mexican gang. At the other end of the street, there's a black gang. Um, they somewhat beefing with each other. You know, you you living in a house on the middle of the block, uh, you know, is drug selling, you know, it, it's shootouts. But then you looking at that shit like, you're fascinated by that lifestyle, and especially if you're growing up in poverty. You know what I'm saying? Your mom's is working hard, but let's face it. You got a single mom and it's three kids in the house. You know, it, it's a struggle. And you look down the street and you see dudes your age driving the latest brand new El Camino. Or, you know, they got the fresh Nissan truck with the ski racks on top or they got the Volkswagen Bugs or whatever was the latest car. And then you got the Dayton's and, you know, they got the pagers and the chains and all the pretty high school girls is, you know, you looking at that lifestyle and you like, man, shit, what, 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 what am I waiting for? All I got to do is go grab a little pack and in a couple of months, I could be the same way, you know? So your visions of, of, of being, uh, somewhat, I guess you want to say normal, you know, your visions of being normal are going out the window. It was for me as a kid. I couldn't see shit else. You know what I'm saying? When, like I said, we growing up in poverty. And so my thing was to join the hood, was be from the hood. Once you from the hood, you got what? You got, you got brotherhood. You got, you know, you got protection. You know, you making money. Everybody know you, you know, your popularity of being a gangster, you know, everybody feared a gangster, whatever, but um, it, it's a no win situation. And that's what the that's what the song is about. The hood took me under. You live in this life of, you know, fatuating you great and everything is lovely for the hood. But at the end of it, you know, the hood done took you under because there's no way out. You know what I'm saying? We either going to jail. We either dead, you know, or we we taking those circumstances and them chances for life to try to be better, but it's still a, a one way street. You feel me? So that's what the song basically was about is 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 young men being infatuated with the gang lifestyle and then becoming and, and joining. And then there's no hope or there's no way out. So that that's what I wrote the song The Hood Took Me Under about, you know, about that not being able to escape because this dudes till this day, you know, some of them just now coming home from doing 30 year bids. You know, the hood took them under. You get me? Because it's 2023, and there's a lot of young homies that I had who got 25 to life or 30 year sentences, and they're just now coming home. You know what I'm saying? So, that basically, like I said, that's what that song was about about the reality of, of, and that, that wasn't just about, you know, being from L.A. That shit is everywhere, you know. So like I said, when I tried to when I wrote songs, I didn't really try to, even though I was from Compton and I represented Compton, I tried to envision what neighborhood life was like everywhere. Because like I said, I've been to Chicago like, you know, thousands of times. And, and even though it ain't no blue or red back then. Uh, the hood take niggas under because it was a gang of homies, you know, that I knew from back then that are still in the pen and locked up, you know, a, 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 a gang of them. And I used to perform for a lot of them cats and they used to fly me out and, you know, big time cats from Chi-Town. And, you know, you see they still locked up behind shit. So, you know, the, the, it, it, it will take you under. That's mercy, belief. mercy. You know, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are just joining us, we're speaking to the legendary MC8 about his career as well as life. And as well as, um, you know, you went triple platinum and some of your albums went diamond. Is that correct, Eight? No, I went, uh, I've been platinum on a lot of my records, a lot of gold. I wish I did have diamond records shit, you know, but uh, <laughs> I've been fortunate to... Uh, have some uh some gold platinum records uh mm -hmm. i've been fortunate to uh portray in some movies and you know we've had a long career as far as mc8 and Compton's most wanted uh uh goes so it, it's been very fortunate that uh 
you know, the people understood the direction that I was trying to come from when I came out as an artist, you know, being where I came from and representing what I was doing, you know, we, we caught a lot of flack back in the days uh, for wanting to express you know, where we was from. And uh, like I said, I never tried to glorify. If you would listen to a lot of my records and my storytelling, uh, there was always a consequence in my stories because uh, I never wanted to glorify that, you know, the gang lifestyle was, you know, going to get you to the top of the plateau because for a lot of dudes I knew, uh, you could be on that high, but eventually you you fall from that ladder. So I never wanted to glorify that. I just wanted to tell stories about uh, why and and what it was for, and so people could get the uh, the, the the meaning of 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 the gang lifestyle of Crips and Bloods and lifestyle in South Central LA and Compton, and for people who was curious about why shit went on how it went. You feel me? Yes, sir. Now, now, Aid, um, the thing that's very interesting about um the time you came out and the uh, music you uh put out is that you were going up against MC8. I'm sorry, against NWA. You had DJ Quick. You had mm -hmm. Easy E, as you mentioned. Um, you had then you had on the East Coast. You had Tupac, and then you mm -hmm. had all these uh uh gangsters, you know, and rappers out here. Um, portraying a life, especially in Compton. And then I've had Reggie Wright on the show. I've had Melvin Farmer. I've had uh, Officer Bobby Ladd. Um, and they all speak about when crack hit in Compton, it changed everything. And Definitely. they were speaking also having Freeway Ricky on the show as well, who was one of the biggest drug dealers in Southern California. But one thing that was interesting is that they would say that when crack hit, it was something. But when PCP and LSD hit, it was even worse because um, the officers couldn't even bring these guys down because they were stronger than they had superhuman strength and it made life so miserable because if you weren't a gangbanger um, or a drug dealer, there was really not much place for you in Compton. Is that correct? Um, everybody, I mean, Compton is, is, is small, but it's so big. Um, if, if if you grew up in Compton, nine out of ten, you was gonna be associated with a neighborhood. Um, the drug lifestyle is what thrived in Compton, you know. Um, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of dudes, you know, smoked sherm. Um, to be out of place, uh, that's that's like that's that's an understatement. Like I said, because everybody wanted to gangbang. Like I said, you had a few, you had a few cats who chose a different route. Um, did that make it easier for them? No, because everywhere you went, you were getting what we would call sweated. Uh, and people wanted to know where you were from and where you were affiliated with. And like you said, um, if you were, you were kind of out of place, but that didn't give you a pass because, you know, it was a lot of innocent victims, you know, who who caught the wrath of, of being uh, affiliated in Compton, uh, which was unfortunate because, you know, we go by this code today that, you know, uh, uh, innocent motherfuckers or, or people who are not affiliated should be recognized as such, you know, that they don't, that they're non-affiliated is what we call them today. But uh, back in my days, you know, everyone was a target. And so that's why it was easy for a lot of uh, uh, young brothers to join gangs because who wants to be an outsider? You still got fucked with and picked on. And now if you're an outsider, shit, you really, you got no help. So if niggas jack you or shoot at you or do anything to you, who you going to run to? So a lot of dudes, you know, coming to age, the, the, the first instinct was to do was to join the neighborhood gang. 
I'm going to be from the neighborhood. Because like I said, they gave you protection. You know, you go wherever you go. People respect, you know what I'm saying? Especially if you was a powerful gang. All you had to do was tell a nigga what set you was from. And you either got respected or you got tried, you know, and that was the lifestyle, you know. So to be an innocent victim in Compton walking around and, you know, I don't gang bang and I don't associate myself, that didn't give you no pass. You still got fucked with, you know what I'm saying? That was just the life of living in Compton. Now, um, you know, hey, being following you for so many years in your career, I know you're the, one of the realest of all of them. And seeing you do your thing and also um, surviving it, which is a question I'm sure my audience is going to be asking. So I'll beat them to the punch. How did you survive uh, living and being the, to the age you are now? Was it your music? Was your acting? What is it that allowed you to uh, survive to the point where the bullets missed you or if they hit you, they didn't take you down? I mean, um, I had a mama who prayed every night uh, because uh, I didn't exclude myself from any of the ill will shit that went on in the neighborhood. Um, yeah, I got shot at, um, you know, enemies, you know, fights. Um, um, Police, I mean, I've been to jail several times, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't even tell you that. Why? Because I don't think I did anything um, differently. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't try to cheat niggas, you know. Um, I always, if I could, had a good rapport with other niggas outside of my gang, you know, whether they was Crips or Bloods. And and the, the code was, you know, uh, we don't like nobody. It's just about us. But I was always one of those motherfuckers who I was a humble nigga. That's what it was. Uh, I, I, I just... Having a mom who hard worked like as she did and the struggle that she went through just to raise, you know, uh, decent kids. Um, I think I respected that a lot. So when it came to decisions that I had to make being involved in the game, uh, I would rather be cordial with a nigga and try to. You know, if the money is wrong, let's try to fix it. Um, if a nigga disrespect it, let's talk it out and see whatever, whatever. Um, it wasn't always, you know, let's pull the heat and just start shooting, you know. Um, and, and like I said, just trying to have respect for other, even though niggas is from different sets. I thought just, you know, trying to have respect for a motherfucker would get you a long way. Um, and then, you know, um, watching my surroundings, you know, growing up in Compton, uh, like I said, went through shootouts, uh, being shot at, uh, fights, uh, uh, jacking by the police. I went through all that shit, carrying guns, you know, all that. Um, I started rapping and with that, it kept me out of the streets so to speak, um, going to the studio. Once I caught the bug, I didn't want to be nowhere but the studio. I didn't want to be on the block serving. Um, you know, I didn't want to just be hanging out, dipping up and down the street with the homies, you know. And did I catch a little flack for that? Yeah, probably, you know, um, because the first aspect is is the neighborhood. You got to represent the neighborhood. And here I am, 15 years old, trying to fucking write raps and shit like that and go to the studio. So that was one of the things that, that kept me out of the streets was being able to um, go to the studio every day. Had fucking um, hooked up with Chill. We formed Compton's Most Wanted. You know, we were both uh, gang banging from the same neighborhood. So I felt because he wanted to, uh, he was uh, curious 
about the rap lifestyle. You know, he lived across the street from uh, where uh, somewhere where Ren used to pull up every day. So we were able to have access to Ren and easy. And then, like I said, we were introduced to uh uh, Lonzo from the Wrecking Crew and DJ Slip and Unknown. So for some 15, 16 year old niggas trying to sell dope and gang bang, we got introduced to the motherfucking music life. And that's what made us see, hey, maybe we could do some other shit. So it kept us out of the streets as far as if if it didn't happen, we'd probably been in jail or probably, you know, six feet under or whatever, you know, the fucking the fucking pitfalls of gang banging. But that's what happened. You know, we got introduced to the microphone. And even though we were representing the neighborhood tough, I was like, nigga, fuck going to the block today. Nigga, let's go to Slip House and go to the studio. And niggas would be like, fuck it. Next thing you know, you look up, we there all week. We ain't left. Niggas ain't went to school. We ain't did shit. We sitting in the garage with Slip 24-7 trying to create because the, the, the rap bug had bit me. And I was like, nigga, this shit is more important than going to school. It's more important than being on the block selling dope. It's more important than, than putting the flag in my back pocket and throwing up the hood at niggas and all that shit and the shit we used to do to represent the block. It was more important than that. So I, I stayed in the studio. And like I said, did we catch, man, you niggas need to be over here, nigga, representing the hood. You niggas need, we caught all of that. But I was like, fuck that shit. I'm finna stay in the studio. And from there, you know, records started getting made, you know? And now I got tapes in the swap meet and little niggas is banging my shit in the hoods. So now when they seeing me, I'm getting a little more, oh, that's that nigga eight. That's that nigga eight. Oh, what's up, my nigga? What's you getting me? It's going from nigga, where you from to Oh, that's that nigga eight. You give me that's that nigga. Oh, you got that song. This is Compton. And like I said, even though you from different sides of the street, I never pushed that in my raps because I felt niggas already know we from Trag New. Niggas already know we Crips. So I ain't finna flex that on. I, I, I'm finna talk for every nigga from Compton who gang banging, who claim the set. So when I made my first rap, it was just, this is Compton. So if you ain't Compton, nigga, this is Compton. And so that's what started giving me the, oh, what's up, eight? What's up, my nigga? So if you was from our side of the tracks, I really didn't start catching beef from, you know what I'm saying, niggas that I would get dirty looks from and, and other crip sets that we would have problems with. I start getting like, oh, what's up, my nigga? Oh, now, it didn't give me a pass from everything because I still had altercations and I still had to get into it with niggas because even though I, I was transitioning, I was still this nigga from this set. So certain places, when I thought I would go places and, oh, nigga, I got a video out. I got a song out. Nigga still was like, let's go. You get me or, or let's go. Because I don't give a fuck about that. You from over there. So it it took a little time. And like I said, I like, like I said, I didn't, I, I wasn't immune from anything that a nigga a nigga who I put myself in that. Because like I said, my life, I started out as a gangbanger. I wasn't a rapper. I was a nigga claiming a hood, fuck you, I shoot you, nigga. This is us. We don't give a fuck. So the transition, I had to, you know, I just had to watch my back because it was still, it was still people out there who was like, we don't give a fuck that you trying to go over there. You still represent that neighborhood because I think I was on my third album and I was still going to Compton every day. So I was still going, so I was still going to the neighborhood every day. How old were you when you had your first record deal? My first record, um, now, if you want to say record deal or if you want to say record, I signed my first contract with Techno Hop Records with Unknown. 
uh, and we put out like a maxi single. It had three songs on it. Uh, from that, that got us a deal with Orpheus Capital. So I was maybe 17, 18. When I put out uh, One Time Gaffled Them Up, I was 18 years old. Now, so, you know, you, you know, ahead, and, and I, just, I want to interject one thing um, while we had it. One thing that was interesting is that you had a lot of gangsters in that video, that music. Oh, them was, all, them was all my homies from the neighborhood. Everybody you saw in the one time gaffled video and niggas was standing against the fence. We was up at Compton High School. You know, Compton was the, the Crip High School. So, you know, they had a big mural at Compton High School that said Blue City, you know, so all the homies, you know, and then that was a. Uh, that was what we called a friendly neighborhood. It wasn't our neighborhood, but Compton High School was in Palmer Block. And we were basically like, say, them was our cousins, you know? So we went to Palmer Block and, you know, I took the video crew. And back then, you know, when you did videos, it was video crews, you know? It was trucks and lights and, you know, look like movie sets and shit. So we rolling through Compton with these trucks and I got video directors out there. And I'm like, man, we gonna set up right here on the corner. And I, all the homies came. We had about 20 of the homies out there and we just lined up against the fence and yeah, that was that was that was real life shit. That was like I didn't know shit about no actors and extras and all that shit, nigga. And and homies felt like shit, nigga. You shooting a video, and we want the world to know this is trag news. So that's what it was, and Thank that's what I felt at the time. You know, Thank it was all about trag new park, and we finna show the world this is trag new. It was it was my way of letting the homies be seen and let niggas know this is our life. So that's why we took that direction. You know what I'm saying? He was requested a whole lot by me on the box network. I'll just tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> I would always tell you everybody motherfucking counted, you know what I'm saying? Because like I said, uh rap was rap was fresh at the time. And uh to have a nigga uh you know representing Compton like that and you know, even though we, we had NWA and we had Easy, but, you know, at that time, them niggas was looked at as, you know, superstars. You get me? So to have a nigga like us, me, come in and a nigga that you just saw yesterday on the block, you know, because uh, un unlike unlike some niggas back then, um, I didn't know how to leave. You, you get me? I didn't know how to leave. I had, I had money. Had status, you know, niggas knew me from here to New York, and like you said, the 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 video was playing fucking every five minutes on the box, and you know, I was doing shows and traveling every day. I was in Compton. I didn't know how to because I didn't know shit else. I didn't know nothing else. Like, oh nigga, you went to New York and you went to Woopy Woop, and when I came home. I went straight back to Compton to the neighborhood. I didn't know nothing else. I had a I had a five bedroom house in Corona, and I would drive fucking up seventy miles every day just to go hang out in Compton on my neighborhood block because I didn't know how to get out of that lifestyle. There was nothing else for me. So sure. until 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 uh. One of my homies had to start telling me, you got to stop coming over here. You you got to stop coming over here. You you not in the position where you can be hanging over here anymore. You need to transition your life and go on about that. So it took me a while, you know what I'm saying, to learn how to uh, grow up, you know, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? So. But it's it's what you it's like I said it's, it's what it's what I was used to. I didn't know anything else. All I knew was Compton. Uh, shit, I didn't go. I, I didn't never. I didn't leave Compton until I got my record deal. You get me? I didn't even go to L.A. Hollywood. What was that? You know, other cities around. I didn't leave Compton. That was that was it for me. So, um, 
being able to start rapping and then to be able to be in the position where I am now and I've been all over the world and all that type of crazy shit. It, it, it's fascinating. You know what I'm saying? Being a young kid, you know, growing up in the streets of Compton and not having as much, uh, you know, you don't have too much hope when you're growing up in poverty, you know, and anybody who comes from that walk of life, it's really a struggle to get your mind to where I got to get the fuck up out of here. You get me? And that be on some real shit. Now, there's a few things that uh, my, my, my inbox is blowing up, but people wanted me to ask you these questions. And believe you me, uh, I really appreciate your time. Eh? Um, it's a, you're a fascinating individual. I grew up watching you. It's just like, it's like, I don't know, it's just a, a pinch me moment because of, um, you know, your talent and um, being on Minister Society, which is, leads to my next question, uh, playing as AWACS. Um, your acting skill was impeccable. No one would ever believe that um, you were just a guy growing up from the hood because your acting was so impeccable on a movie that was absolutely a, a childhood iconic movie. To this day, it's rated as one of the top five gangster movies ever made. So tell us a little bit about um, how were you able to get into the character of AWAC so well? Um, I was on my like, uh, what? I think I was working on my third album, uh, Music to Drive By. Um, like I said, I was still in the neighborhood. Um, bought me a low rider, you know, up and down Crenshaw. I'm, like I said, I was still uh, associated, affiliated, so to speak. Um, at the time, you know, a lot of those movies were starting to pop off. Uh, we had South Central, we had Juice, uh, we had Boys in the Hood, we had Trespass, you get me? Uh, so a lot of movies were incorporating the, the gangster rapper, right? Um, Hughes Brothers, you know, film students, uh, shot all the Tupac's first. They were real good friends with Tupac. Uh, shot all the Tupac's first videos. Um, me, I'm just eight from Compton, you know, just still doing me, whatever. I get a call uh, to do, uh, to come read for this script. And I'm thinking like, why? Niggas ain't gonna fuck with me, you know. I'm, that, that's what I'm thinking because I heard at the time they were also trying to get Ren to come in, and so um, Ren, you know, it's MC Ren, it's NWA. The fuck they gonna pick me? It was, it's, it's, it's MC Ren. You feel me? So I thought it was a waste of time. I didn't want to go. Uh, my manager talked me into going. Um, so I went. Like I said, I don't go to Hollywood. I didn't do that shit. Like, so I go to Hollywood, um, get the script, um, read it for a couple of days, go back, read. They want me to read for eight wax. I'm like, okay, I read. What I do is I read the whole script because I want to see what the fucking movie's about. So I go, okay, it's a hood movie. Okay. So a wax is, you know, a nigga from the hood, you know, like I'm from the hood. You feel me? I'm like, do this shit every day, you know? So when I went in there, I just, I ad-libbed the gang of shit. Like, I'm like, this some movie written shit. Oh, you want a nigga to act like this? Okay, well, let me show you what we really do on in the hood. And bing, bing, bing. And so from that, they was like, oh, yeah, it, it, you, you it. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so you really didn't need a script to portray... What it was, hood it life was, was. It, no, I mean, because if y'all finna do a movie about hood life, I, I'm living that shit every day. I just, I'm, when I leave here, I'm going back to the hood and I'm finna stand on the corner and we finna smoke weed and the homies next to me finna be serving. I ain't gotta serve no more because I'm rapping, but. I'm still, nigga, I got my pistol under the seat, nigga, we, like, niggas come through, I'm still, like, on deck, pulling up, like, I live the neighborhood life, so, oh, this what you want, oh, fuck, yeah, we do this, and we get out like this, and, I, and we talk like this, and yeah, niggas don't do like that, we do like this, so they was like, oh, okay, 
official. So they called me back. I think I read one more time for like the producers and all of that. And then it was a go. And then so once we started shooting, um, same shit, like wardrobe, uh, lines in the script. I'm like, no, we don't say that shit. And no, we don't wear that. No, we don't wear that. No. So I was able to be me. I was just able to be me in the in the shit. So I just put myself in in everyday scenarios like I was doing. Shit, when I left the movie set, I'm going to drag new. Shit. I, when I before I go to the movie set, I'm in drag new. I didn't do nothing else. You get me? So when it was time for those parts that I guess you could say they were, you know, authenticity. So I was able to do that because it was no acting to me. Like, and so now that you want it to be on some screen shit, let me make this shit authentic. You get and me? Boy, did you do that? Hey, you were a pretty sinister dude in there, uh, your character Ajax. People need to go hit AWAX. People need to watch uh, Minister Society for those young bucks who weren't born at the time. Unbelievable right. movie. And it even made Lorenz take. He we were he was so believable as a gangster. Oh, nobody would have nobody would have never believed that my dude was a straight actor. You get me? Um, he surprised the hell out of me because that was somebody I hung with. Like every time we was on set, he was my dude because I was fascinated with the motherfucker little nigga. I'm like, this nigga's is real, and and you would never know when the motherfuckers yelled action. That nigga went in the character and he was like, so it was great for him. But, you know, that's an actor for you. You get me? And, and I'm sure uh, uh, during that time, like he used to tell me, he used to get tested a lot. You get me? Because niggas want to know, you know, they see you on screen and you hard. You know, he had to bring motherfuckers back to reality and like, dude, you know. I'm an actor, you know, because he was so believable as a young motherfucker because it's so many of them in the neighborhood. It's so many of them. Um, I ain't got no hope, no vision of tomorrow. Like, what the fuck am I going to do outside of the hood? The hood life is everything. And then they have that extra switch. You get me? There's some dudes from the hood that's calm and you'll never get into a confrontation with. And even though they from the hood and they or die for the hood, whatever, there's just, it, it's all kind of aspects of niggas from the hood. You got the niggas who, without no question, who will just pull up and like, I ain't even talking. Boom, 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 boom. Then you got niggas you can reason with and woonty woon. Then you got the niggas who make money and all about that life. So it's different aspects. When you got them crazy pet bulls, you get me, those the niggas you sick on everybody. You know, when it's time to do work, hey, I do it. I do it. So hey, he, um, go ahead. Fans are blowing up with questions. Uh, they're really enjoying it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm enjoying it on our special uh, uh, 11 a.m. episode of the Sherrard Show, uh, speaking to the legendary MC8. You know, eight, I remember in a lot of your songs, you were known as Eight Ball. Are you still known as Eight Ball? No, just MC8. A lot of people would confuse me with Eight Ball and MJG because we was both, you know, eight and you know, Eight Ball. And then on my album cover, I would symbolize with the Eight Ball or whatever. But uh, that's what people would get the confusion. You know what I'm saying? Because similar, he was from the South Braids. I was from Compton Braids. So a lot of people would cross the MC8 and just familiarize it with, oh yeah, that's eight ball. That's eight ball. You know what I'm saying? So I, I would get that a lot, but you know, everybody would, everybody, uh, you know, from, 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 from the jump, you know, they knew the differences. You get me. Um, they knew I represented South Central. I mean, Southern Cali, Compton. Uh, I think uh, Eight Ball was from Memphis or somewhere down that way. So, um, but we used to tour a lot too. So, you know, that was official. So, so uh, which did you enjoy the most? Eight, um, playing as as uh, a wax on um, Minister Society or being a voiceover. Um, it's Lance in uh, San Andreas. Oh, I mean, it's and, and and it's crazy because I've never played Grand Theft Auto. Never played it. Um, uh, I got hooked up with Grand Theft Auto. Uh, shout out to my to my people's DJ Pooh. Um, 
DJ Pooh was working with Rockstar. Um, uh, the first one was they had a couple of my songs on the radio station, I think on the first Grand Theft Auto. Um, and then from there, um, uh, they hit me up one day and said they were working on this game and uh, they wanted me to come uh, do the voiceovers for this character. Now, I had never been in that situation. I mean, I had done, you know, movies, but... I didn't know how, you know, a video game, how was that going to work? So they flew me to New York, put me in the studio, like I go in the studio. And then they would play me scenes of the video game and whatever. So, and then they would give me a script and just sort of like in minutes, you know, certain things that the character was doing in the game and I would match up, you know, what he was doing with what I would say or what I thought was authentic from being from the streets and, you know, added a couple of jazz in there and, you know, to give it my originality. And uh, yeah, that's how Grand Theft Auto and, and Ryder became about. The character symbolized, looked a little bit like Easy e you know, with the jerry curl and, and the hat on and the, and, the, and, the, and the glasses. So I guess they figured, like, who would be better to voice this character that we're trying to mimic, you know, let's get eight. So I was suggested by DJ Pooh. And like I said, after doing records and hearing my voice and Menace and all of that, they thought it would be perfect. So shout out to Rockstar. Do you not know? Uh, I think, like I said, the difference, I, I, like I said, really, I couldn't tell you. I mean, they were both great experiences. Um, they both put me, uh, Menace, you know, took me to a certain place. Um, Grand Theft Auto introduced me to the younger audience. You know what I'm saying? A lot of kids, you know, even though they shouldn't have been, but they did. A lot of kids played Grand Theft Auto. I think my son was about maybe six at the time, seven. Uh, so all his friends were fascinated that, you know, they got to hear me on a video game. And, you know, it, it was, you know, it, it, I, I attribute it to great experiences. You know what I'm the saying? Second biggest best-selling Grand Theft Auto of all time. I heard that. I heard San Andreas was good. See, San yeah. Andreas depicted life in Compton in the early 90s. The lead exactly. character's name was CJ. And Ryder was one of his boys and he uh -huh. had smoke and he had all these other guys as well. And it was a wonderful depiction. So when I picked the game up and saw you on it, um, uh, you were writing your element <clears throat> because CJ, that was the only Grand Theft Auto where he could work out and get bigger. And, you know, he can exactly. change look and all this stuff. So absolutely incredible. You, uh, for you kids don't play the game. It's not for kids, but definitely it's not for kids. For you all who missed it, who are an adult, you definitely want to check it out. Now, Adam, um, I know your time is precious, but I have one other question to ask you um, as well. Now, um, I know you all are friends now, but way back in 92, um, there was a feud, a beef between you and DJ Quick. You care to talk a bit about that? Um, gang lifestyle. Um, a lot of people... Um, have to realize that before there was MC8 or DJ Quick, there was Trag New Park and Treetop Pyrus. We were Crips, they were Bloods. That's that's just the get down. You feel me? Um, I was a young dude. I was what, 17, 18, 19 when I started rapping. Um, I'm probably sure the same thing for Quick in his neighborhood. You know, first thing is first. You get me? You rep the hood. Um, how the beef started, like I said, it was probably just, like I said, first things first. I'm a Crip, he's a blood. So that, that that's it. You get me? That That's, that's gonna, that basically lights the fuse. I'm a Crip and he's a blood. Now you got platforms, you get me? Because now MC8 is, you know, this rapper dude and he's got a little fame and whatever and Quick puts out his record. And now he's got fame and, you know, so um, 
and then we're letting the uh, we're letting the outside parties, you know, because I'm at home in Corona, which is probably sixty miles from Compton. He's probably at home where he's living, sixty seventy miles from Compton. But you still got niggas living in Compton every day. You still got Trag New Park Crips living in Compton every day. You still got Treetop Bloods living in Compton every day. They got to roll these same streets. Like I said, Compton is big, but it's small as a motherfucker. And you could be here, drive two blocks. You in another neighborhood. You get me? So, and then the way the arrogance of of the gang banger, nigga, I'm going to go where the fuck I want to and don't give a fuck about your hood, nobody else hood or whatever. So you still got confrontations on the streets. And then, you know, um, as as not being, you know, mature enough, I'm 19 years old. I'm still repping the neighborhood. Give a fuck about no rap shit. So when I go to concerts, nigga, it's, it's this, nigga. Fuck that nigga. And it's this, nigga. So now all my fans who Crips, yeah, yeah, yeah. He go do shows. It's fuck eight. Nigga, we bloods. So all his fans is woop de woo woo. And, and and the confrontations is 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 heavy. You know, the confrontations is heavy because outside of this record shit, it's niggas still willing to die for these neighborhoods. So that's what that's what basically took the beef from some record shit to niggas can die behind this. And there were incidences where, you know, it was some real tragic moments behind eight and quick beefing. You feel me? So I think at a, at one point, because you saw what was happening in music, and let's be honest, at this time, niggas is musicians and rappers, and we want to we wanna survive the fruits of our labor. But, you know, you still got, you know, you still what they call peer pressured by outside influences to, man, you got to rip the hood, man. Fuck that nigga and fuck that nigga. But in actuality, I'll probably do a record with this motherfucker. You get me? But you can't do that when you got outside influences pushing the narrative of, nigga, this is hood shit first. So um, watching Tupac shit watching Biggie shit, and then outside of that, you still, you they, everybody had beefs, you get me? Dog Town was beefing with with, with Knockout and, and Drayster. I mean, we was beefing with Quick and them. Uh, if you was affiliated with a gang, you probably was beefing with a nigga who was rapping. People didn't see all that shit because you see just the the highlighted shit, but the streets was hot behind that shit. So just watching niggas, getting... just watching niggas go through shit, and you know people get shot at, and outside parties, you know, uh, losing their lives, and you know there were incidences where it was just tragic. You know, it it just came a time to where niggas, you know, we just grew up. And was like, man, let's just, I mean, what are we beefing about? I mean, I don't even, I really didn't, I don't, I don't know you like that. You know what I'm saying? And I know that we got pushed as far as representing the hood and whatever. But at this time, man, shit, ain't you living good? I'm living good. Nigga, I ain't got no problem with how you get down. So that's how we squash the beat. Me and Quick done work together. We hang out. I mean, every probably every show I do right now is with Quick, you know. Wow, you know, so. that's beautiful. That's wonderful, man. We, I mean, if you're on the West Coast, a lot of my a lot of our we do a lot of shows together. I mean, so that was a point in time where you couldn't book, you know. I, I yeah, you couldn't book us. I remember, together. I remember. Yeah. I remember sometimes promoters would try to book us, and as soon as you see both our names on the flyer, two days later, somebody was getting pulled off because it was going to be track. It was going to be an issue. So just being able to mature from that and, uh, 
like I said, being able to withstand from that because, like I said, at one point in time, it was real serious. Um, it was. I remember it went from 92 to 98, actually. Yeah, beat. yeah, we beat, we beat for a while. And like I said, a lot of that was because of wanting to represent where we was from. You get me? I want to remain true to the neighborhood. So if I got a blood nigga dissing me, man, please. Man, we finna go, we finna war to the end of time. And this ain't even about no record shit. I ain't even got, man, fuck a record. Nigga, them niggas is from over there and this is where we from. So that's what, that's what basically pushed it. Because if it was probably just on some rap shit, we probably would have shook hands a long time ago and been like, oh man, whatever. But this shit was full, fueled by Crippin' Blood shit. That's what that was fueled by. Like I said, before I started rapping, I was claiming Track New Park. So I'm not finna, I'm not finna like outstep the code. Like we don't, we not cool with no bloods. Like what the fuck is that? No. Shit, right now, man, I do it. I know a thousand blood niggas. You know, we party together, we business together, we do, but you know, that's that takes maturity, man. I don't give a fuck where you from. Shit. You can be from the moon. I don't care. Can we get some money? Shit. <laughs> That's how I live. Shit. Then you could be an alien and wear green. Can we get some money? Shit. That's how I look at it. <laughs> let me come to let me come to your moon hood. You make sure everything is great. And so that's how we live. But that takes maturity. You know what I'm saying? Now, you gotta be able that, to H, you, you have a hit podcast out. Um, is that called Great Gangster Chronicles? Gangsta Chronicles with my boy Steel. Um, shout out to Charlemagne the God. We on Black Effect Network. Shout out to iHeart. Um, it's a, it's you know, it's it's the new thing right now. Um, I never looked at myself as a podcaster. You know, I'm a true hip hop head, uh, but I've learned that um, people out there like to hear real in depth conversations about real shit. Um, it's intriguing to some people. And just to see that motherfucker is intelligent and not dumb. You get me? Um, I, I pride myself on being able to, uh, being articulate enough to have conversations with people and, and not to be like, damn, this nigga dumb. You know, because you get some interviews, you know, where, come on, man. Come on. I'm not trying to laugh on that one. Come on. <laughs> I know you, you had a couple of interviews where you probably sitting up like, God damn. But, you know, I, I just pride myself on, even though I came from them walks of life, um, uh, my mom was smart. Uh, she always kept her foot in my ass. You know, she's from Gulfport, Mississippi. So, you know, even though I had my... Uh, transitions of trying to find my way she always supported what i did so uh that's that's first you know uh so being able to talk to people find out their stories uh have conversations about what's going on today outside of you know we the gangster chronicles but we show that uh our gangsterism is being able to survive where we came from and we like to have conversations with gangsters and normal people and and being able to be in touch with the issues of the day and not just who shot a nigga last night and who sold some dope and who went to jail for 30 years um we like to show the transition of niggas who've done that and made it to the other side. And then we talk to, uh, you know, hip hop artists and get their stories of their walks of life of coming from the streets and 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 where they had to come from to get started. And and then and then trying to show um anything positive for the youth today. You know, a lot of the youngsters is a lot of the youngsters is crazy today. And uh, you know. Uh, being able to podcast and talk to them and let them hear the stories and some of the walks of life of where we've been through. Because like I used to, like I tell people now, um, I came from that. So I get it. You know how we are, all the youngsters, they don't do nothing but this and that and whoopty whoop and they all crazy and whoop. And I said, but shit, that was me once. I was once 19 and 20 and rapping about nigga, this is Compton and fuck that shit. And we sold dope and we got chased by the police and a nigga tried to blast on us and whoop de It was what I went through. 
You feel me? So I understand some of what they go through and it takes time to transition. You know, it takes time to get mature, you know, uh, because like I said, let's 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 face it. We was all 18, 19 and we all felt like we were some bad motherfuckers. Invincible. And you can't tell me shit. Mm. And, and you might got a mama, you might got a daddy, but in the back of your head, you was going, nigga, I'm invincible. Mercy, and, mercy. And, and but, I, but, can, I can take on the world. You feel me? So it, on that on that template, I was speaking to Melvin Farmer about that. And uh yeah, check his episode out on Area and Pure Essence Television. Um, what was it like for you though when you felt you were that tough and then you spent your first night in, in jail or prison? <sighs> It was tough, you know, because, um, you know, I I didn't break down and cry or no shit like that. But you get to thinking from the first day I went to jail, um, you know, you get you feel like, you know, I've proven you get me, uh, you know, I'm in jail. And a lot of niggas grew up like that. Excuse me. Coming from where I came from. It was a rite of passage to go to jail or go to prison. You felt like, nigga, I made it. I'm official. Because when I go back to the block, niggas going to be like, oh, my nigga, you get me? Um, but you start thinking, you get me? Because like I said, we were the type, like, back in my days, nigga, we got picked up every other day. And, and, you know, sometimes we did long stretches. Sometimes we did a week, a couple of days, a couple of months. But even after that, you, you start getting like, you start changing from, yeah, motherfucker. Yeah, we walking around this motherfucker bad to, I don't want to come to this motherfucker no more. You get me? It, 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 it starts changing you. Like, and nobody, and anybody who done been to jail, I don't give a fuck how hard you are. You don't want to be in that motherfucker. And it start making you think about the choices you make. So, you know, I probably was probably around 19, 20, been to jail about 15 times, just bullshit, in and out of jail, in and out of jail, in and out of jail, in and out of jail. You know, because back then, if they didn't catch you with no, no dope on you or they didn't catch you with the pistol, they just rack you up and throw you in for that. They call it just rounding up niggas, getting them off the streets. You feel me? Um, I mean, shit, we jack a nigga, rob a nigga, shit. We go to jail for six months, get out big, get back out. We back out in the hood. Shit, at that time, you feeling like, shit, you invincible. You get me? Nigga, I done been to jail. I was in there with the homies kicking it. Nigga, we was chilling, bing, bing. Now I'm back out, and niggas know, oh, this nigga just got out. You know what I'm saying? That make the that make the younger niggas or the niggas who ain't took that route yet, they start, they start looking at you as a different motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? You really represent, nigga. You don't went to jail. Like I said, to some niggas, that was like the rite of passage. Nigga, I made it to prison. I made it to the county. I made it to Wayside. Well, you know, wherever you was going. It, but like I said, you start getting mature and you start going, fuck this shit. Now, eight, um. I'm not going to keep up much of your time, and it. it's it's been a fascinating interview with you. I really appreciate you taking this Tuesday morning um, to be on the Sherrard Show. Um, my audience members, I knew they would. They're asking where can they get that Compton shirt you have on. This Compton shirt right here is a courtesy of my uh, one of my designers. He's a uh, works for Compton for Life Clothing. You can hit him up on uh, his Instagram page, Compton for Life Clothing, and he's got all this. Oh, he got all your Compton gear, everything that that's about Compton. He's got the gear up. Uh, I try to uh, uh, with 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 young designers and you know people who are really trying to you know transition. Um, I try to help them out. So anything they design or anything they push, they might you know have a little corner swap meet spot no advertisement no whatever but uh i try to support dudes who try to work hard man and try to um do something else than than what they think is the norm 
we should do in these situations and where we live and whatever. So um, I support, you know, um, that's what I do. And then I, I also, you know, I try to give them the platforms to get their shit off because everybody everybody will look at me and be like, oh, you know, is that your stuff? And automatically get it from here, get it. And so that that's what I do for dudes. So in, anytime you see me rocking somebody gear, man, go support, you know, it ain't going to break your pockets. It's reasonable. And then you get to represent, man. So I appreciate it. Once again, Compton for Life Clothing. You can hit him up on Facebook or Instagram and guarantee the product is quality and he going to get it to you official. Yeah, I'm gonna get one. I tell you, uh, my audience, the next next episode of Shirasha, you're gonna see me wear my Compton for life. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Got, got all colors. We got black, you know. So you know, don't worry about whatever side you're from. We got red. We got black. We got you know, purple, green, white, whatever you need. You know what I'm saying? So represent. Do that for a young designer. Help him get his stuff off, and we all good. Monitor, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, eight, you're still performing. Is that correct? You still you still going towards? I'm, I'm all over the place. Um, I'm I'm probably on the road for the next uh, two months. I'm in Dallas this weekend. Next week, I'm in Oxnard. I'm in Monrovia. I'm in Cleveland. I'm in Portland. I'm in Washington D.C. Wow. Uh, so I'm moving around, man. I also got a, my son um, just graduated high school. He's on his way to college. Uh, he's been attending Valparaiso University at Indiana. He's got a football scholarship. So you see me rocking a gang of Valpo stuff. So you know that's what it is. Um, congrats, congrats. So now, um, now, now, hey, where can people keep up with what you got going on? Your Facebook, Instagram, et cetera? Because I know people want to know your on, uh, on Instagram, you can hit me up at 808. That's E I H T, the number zero, E I H T, 8 Compton on Facebook. Uh, you can hit me up at the Gangsta Chronicles podcast. We're on Instagram. Uh, that's where I'm headed right now. We got to get this episode shot today. Uh, but, you know, my people said, uh, you know, we got to do firsthand this, this interview right here. So shout out my man right here. Um, but, yeah, that's what we do. Hit me up, man. I, I try to fuck with everybody. You know, I'm not one of those dudes who... Uh, got my manager running shit and doing all that type of shit. I try to connect with people on a real basis because I'm just a regular nigga and I, I, I'm I'm just a humble dude. I appreciate, you know, uh, being on your platform right here just to be able to uh, keep people up on MC8 and Compton's Most Wanted. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, it's not about money or fame or nothing like that. Uh, I came in the game being a true hip hop artist uh, I love hip hop. It's been here 50 years. Uh, I think I've been around, uh, you know, maybe five, 10 years after it started. So um, Compton's Most Wanted and MC8 is, you know, we still here. You know, I'm still dropping music. Uh, you can check Good out. Music. Good still music. Drop, I'm still dropping music. I got the projects out right now. Lessons one and two. Like I said, you can check me out on the podcast and just that's what it is, man. I appreciate everybody. Appreciate the fans. Remember to stay humble and appreciate what you got. And that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Abe, for stopping by the Shiraz Show. I really appreciate this legendary individual. This episode will be airing on Airy TV and Pure Essence this weekend. And also stay tuned on our next episode of the Shiraz Show, where we have the legendary Samuel Jackson stopping by, fresh off of his trip to Italy, talking about his new movie and film as well. I'm Sherard for MC8 and all my friends and fans out there. Remember, if you ever want to soar with the Eagles, stop hanging around turkeys. I'm Sherard. I'll see you next episode. Bye-bye now.